our prehistory is 100% listener funded, so please consider becoming a patron of the show. For $3 a month, you gain access to exclusive episodes, maps, and timelines. Your support allows our exploration of prehistory to continue. To become a patron, click on the link in the description of this episode, or go to patreon.com slash ourprehistory. It had been two days since the hunting party left camp. Three men stalked through a treeless tundra. They could see far into the distance over the green and orange of the summer growth. The hunters moved quietly, following old paths made by reindeer trampling the knee-high shrubs. The oldest man in the group was concerned by the absence of fresh tracks. Around his neck hung a splendid piece of green serpentine, decorated with a red pattern. He understood the fragility of life and wondered if he had angered the animal spirits. No reindeer had been spotted in five days. In desperation to find prey, the old man had led his party away from their usual territory. Even during these summer days, the hunters craved the warmth of a tent. There was little to burn when they ventured this far north. Besides reindeer meat, firewood was the most valued resource to their people. As they walked down a slope towards a small creek, a strange mound came into sight. Out of curiosity, the old man approached it. Emerging from the ground and engulfed by grass, he discovered the ends of astonishingly large bones. His face was overcome by solemn reverence when he realized that he beheld the remains of an ancient giant. Nearby, another hunter found the remains of an ancient camp, and from the debris, he picked up a stone carved into the shape of a woman. None of them had ever seen such an image. The old man pondered these discoveries. He'd encountered mammoth bones before, but these creatures lived only in the mythology of his people. His wife often delighted the young children of the band with stories of hairy giants with long tusks. Many generations ago, their ancestors had offended the spirit of the mammoths, who then departed these lands forever. The old man concluded that this mound was sacred, a place where his ancestors had left offerings to the spirit of the great giant. He would tell his wife about it upon returning to camp. This man lived 23,000 years ago, during the peak of the last ice age, near the Dniester River in Ukraine. As descendants of the Gravedians, his people perpetuated their ancient customs in a much impoverished environment. Welcome to Our Prehistory, Episode 16, Last Glacial Maximum. Hunter-gatherers living during the peak of the Gravedian lived in a world of abundance, full of wild resources. Their skeletons showed little evidence of nutritional deficiencies. Dressed richly in adornments, these Ice Age people imposed lasting images in rock and ivory. Among collections of Gravedian bands in the more densely populated areas of Europe, strong regional identities emerged, seen today in uniform artistic styles. These identities are what we would today call a tribe or ethnic group. These Gravedian tribes, composed of a few hundred people, established relationships with other tribes, transferring materials, knowledge, and customs over long distances. These networks grew to encompass the entire continent between 33,000 and 29,000 years ago, and linked people living thousands of kilometers apart. 
but the world of abundance built by Gravedian tribes would gradually disappear. Life would become more difficult, hunting grounds abandoned, and tool-making knowledge forgotten. Over the course of the next two episodes, we will explore this reversal of fortune, which would have a long-reaching impact on European prehistory. The cause of this decline is not much of a mystery. The end of the Gravedian coincides with the peak of the last ice age, a period known as the last glacial maximum. Even though the last ice age lasted for about 100,000 years, it did not reach its coldest phase until near the end, and when it did, conditions for plant, animal, and human life declined substantially in many parts of the world. Around 30,000 years ago, global temperatures fell dramatically, and the amount of ice on the planet grew consistently for 4,000 years. Ice sheets formed over North America, Europe, and tall mountain ranges. As more and more of the planet's water became ice, the oceans dropped to 130 meters below their current level. In some places, the falling seas exposed large expanses of new land that were once the ocean floor. Most glaciers around the world reached their largest size between 26,500 and 19,000 years ago. Today, many paleoclimatic experts define that 7,500-year interval as the last glacial maximum. In Europe, two large ice sheets formed. During the Middle Gravedian, only northern Scandinavia and Russia had been covered by ice, but as the climate grew colder, this Eurasian ice sheet expanded southward. By 24,000 years ago, it covered all of Scandinavia, the Baltic states, along with two-thirds of Britain, part of Denmark, and the northern edges of Germany, Poland, and Russia. It would remain more or less in that position for 4,000 years. If you were to stand at the base of this glacier, you would be confronted with a mountain of ice reaching more than 500 meters into the air. At its center in Scandinavia, this ice sheet was more than 2 kilometers thick. The second large ice sheet in Europe formed over the Alps, covering the entire mountain range. These glaciers flowed down the slopes, extending below 1,000 meters elevation in places. The alpine ice reached its largest size by 26,000 years ago, earlier than the ice sheet to the north. Due to the proximity of these massive blankets of ice, the impact of the last glacial maximum on air temperatures in Europe was especially dramatic. Dry, cold air masses flowed from the ice sheets into northern Europe. On average, the planet was 6 degrees Celsius colder than today but some parts of Europe were as much as 15 degrees colder. The most extreme cooling occurred in the north, right next to the Eurasian ice sheet, where the year-round average temperature was minus 20 degrees Celsius. On the other hand, in southern Europe, the decline was less severe. The Italian peninsula would have had an average yearly temperature between 5 and 10 degrees Celsius above freezing. However, across the continent, winter temperatures were more affected than summer ones, and even on the Mediterranean coast, 5 degrees Celsius below freezing would have been typical in January. To make matters worse, most of Europe received less precipitation than today, which is evident in the continent's pollen record, which reveals the spread of drought-tolerant plant species during the last glacial maximum. Climate models suggest around a 15% decline in rain and snowfall compared to today. Ever since the arrival of Homo sapiens, Europe had been relatively cold and dry, and covered in more grassland than forest. But the last glacial maximum took those conditions to the extreme. Not only did the continental ice sheet migrate southward, but so did the permafrost. This zone, in which the ground below the surface never thaws, covered the entire area north of the Alps and Carpathian Mountains, and most of the Eastern European Plains. Before the climatic downturn, 
the people of the Gravediant had thrived on resources provided by the Mammoth Steppe. However, under permafrost, plant growth is severely limited, and short tundra shrubs dominate the landscape. During the last glacial maximum, tundra plants and animals appeared in northern Europe, thousands of kilometers from where they are found today. Pollen records show that south of the permafrost zone, grassy steppe dominated the landscape. Tree cover was at an all-time low, but conifers still survived in northern Europe, scattered amongst the tundra steppe, especially on protected and moist mountain slopes. Further south, woodlands, including deciduous trees like oak, persisted on the wetter stretches of the Mediterranean coast. In extreme cases, desert-like landscapes appeared. For example, sand blown from the Atlantic coast formed dunes in southern France. The general decline in plant ground cover led to a new, unpleasant phenomenon. Dust storms in northern Europe picked up loose dirt, transporting these small particles hundreds of kilometers. This dust is found today in thick layers of sediment called loess. A critical result of these ecological transformations was a reduction in the number of many European animals. During the last glacial maximum, Europe was an impoverished environment. Not only did winter temperatures pose a deadly threat to humans, but steppe ecosystems became less productive, providing less food. And yet, hunter-gatherers survived in these conditions for hundreds of generations. Some groups did this by adapting their lifestyle, while others migrated southward. Many parts of northern Europe were left uninhabited, especially within 300 kilometers of the Scandinavian ice sheet. People rarely ventured north of the Alps or Carpathian Mountains, and large parts of the cold Russian steppe was abandoned, including the heartland of the Kostenki Avdevo culture of the late Gravedian. It is sometimes claimed that during the last glacial maximum, humans only survived in three southern peninsulas of Europe, the Iberian, Italian, and Balkan. And although people did take refuge in those warmer regions, many archaeological sites that date between 26,000 and 19,000 years ago have also been found further north, in the Carpathian Basin, along the northern coast of the Black Sea, and in the eastern foothills of the Carpathian Mountains. It seems that stable populations of people survived in what is today Austria, Hungary, Romania, Moldova, and Ukraine. Also, the largest concentration of ancient camps from this period is found north of the Pyrenees Mountains in southern France, where a relatively large population survived. So the geographic contraction of our species in Europe during the last glacial maximum was not as extreme as sometimes thought. And yet, the decline in the human population was dramatic. Many forager bands, unable or unwilling to adapt or migrate, perished. This can be seen not only in the number of archaeological sites, but also in genetic studies. DNA extracted from the bones of dozens of Upper Paleolithic individuals allows for comparisons of the genetic composition of Europeans before and after the peak of the Ice Age. These studies show a reduction in genetic diversity during the last glacial maximum, suggesting a genetic bottleneck in which many ancestral lineages disappeared. Intriguingly, the extreme environmental conditions also left a permanent mark on the appearance of the people who survived the Ice Age. Certain facial features, such as large eyes and noses, disappeared from the European population. Also, the Ice Age survivors were shorter than their ancestors, whereas Gravedian women stood 162 centimeters tall on average about the same as modern Europeans, after the glacial maximum, the average woman stood only 153 centimeters tall, a 9 centimeter decline. 
analysis of ancient DNA shows that this change in height was caused by changes in the frequency of specific genes that affect stature. Also, Gravedians had stronger leg muscles but weaker arms than their post-Ice Age descendants. The reason for these physical changes has not been determined conclusively, but a likely explanation for the change in height is that it was an adaptation to the cold, since a shorter body can conserve heat more efficiently. In other words, natural selection during the peak of the Ice Age may have eliminated the long body shape of the out of Africa migrants, leaving behind a more adequate stature for cold Europe. In this way, Europeans became more like the Neanderthals they had replaced. The changing environment, combined with the contraction of the human population during the glacial maximum, had an immense impact on the cultural landscape of Europe. We learned last week that this impact began during the late Gravedian, around 29,000 years ago, when new practices appeared, such as the production of shouldered points in Eastern Europe. Gradually, human groups dwindled and grew isolated from each other, as northern regions transformed into desolate tundra and alpine glaciers grew Travel between Eastern and Western Europe declined. Only a narrow corridor connected the Italian and Iberian peninsulas. This cold mountainous gap between the Alpine glaciers and the Mediterranean Sea was only 30 kilometers wide and probably rarely crossed. Across this divide, Gravedian tribes lost contact with each other. As a result, Western and Eastern Europe followed very different cultural trajectories following the Gravedian. Many old traditions, including approaches to stone tool making and artistic styles, were abandoned by hunter-gatherers across Europe between 26,000 and 24,000 years ago, and the new culture that replaced the Gravedian in Iberia, for example, was quite different from that in Italy, which itself was different from the new culture of the Eastern Plains. Europe was no longer culturally unified as it had been during the Auric Nation and Gravedian. During the last glacial maximum, for 7,500 years, isolated European tribes evolved to form unique identities, more different from each other than at any other period of the Upper Paleolithic. The Iberian Peninsula and southern France hosted the greatest concentration of people during the glacial maximum. The culture that emerged here is called the Solutrian. This is the area of Europe where old artistic traditions were most faithfully perpetuated. We will dedicate next episode to exploring this culture. In Central and Eastern Europe, archaeologists refer to the period that follows the Gravedian as the Epigravedian. This name reflects the fact that some types of stone tools from the Gravedian continued to be used. Specifically, some forager bands in these regions kept making hunting weapons with backed bladelets and shouldered points. The Epigravedian as a category is quite different from the Aurignacian and Gravedian. Whereas those can be considered, at least to some degree, Cultures unified by specific technological and symbolic practices, the Epigravedian is much more of a grab bag of diverse customs. In fact, the term Epigravedian should simply be thought of as a period of prehistory in Central and Eastern Europe, not as a discrete culture. The study of prehistoric camps from Italy to Russia reveals that the people living in those places made very different tools. For example, the degree to which backed bladelets were used and the general sophistication of stone tool technology varies substantially. So the Epigravedian is really a combination of many small local cultures. This phase of prehistory covers a long time span, beginning during the last glacial maximum about 26,000 years ago, 
and ending in some places as late as 11,700 years ago, when the last ice age officially ends. The Epigravedian lasted for 14,000 years, more than any other period of the European Upper Paleolithic. But labeling all that time with one name is misleading. During the Epigravedian, the life of hunter-gatherers underwent major changes, and large migrations of people altered the demographic makeup of Europe. As a result, the Epigravedian is typically broken down into two parts. The early phase, which is basically the last glacial maximum from 26,000 to 19,000 years ago, and the subsequent late phase. Today, we will focus on the life of people during the early Epigravedian. When we compare the locations where the foragers of Eastern and Western Europe chose to live during the last glacial maximum, an interesting difference emerges. People living around the Carpathian Mountains seem to have been able to endure colder temperatures than those in the West. The largest known concentration of ancient campsites with early Epigravedian tools seems to be well within the permafrost zone, between 47 and 50 degrees north latitude, where average temperatures would have been just below freezing. On the other hand, the Salutrian foragers of central France never ventured north of the permafrost boundary, concentrating further south around 45 degrees north. This observation seems to show that some early Epigravedian groups chose to live in colder environments than Salutrians. Different explanations have been suggested by experts for this strange observation. Some propose that a cultural difference existed in which Easterners developed a greater capacity through knowledge and technology to survive the cold after generations of life in the Russian steppe, which always experienced colder winters than Western Europe. Others argue that the people of Eastern Europe did not necessarily seek out a cold climate, but picked areas with essential resources. The Carpathian Mountains received more precipitation than the surrounding area, providing water for animal herds and trees. Pollen records show that pine forests survived on the slopes of these mountains, and the charcoal of pine wood has been found in the fires made by early Epigravedian foragers. The mountain slopes may have been the refuge they found when treeless tundra and dry steppe dominated the surrounding plains. Mediterranean Europe was an important haven for humans during the last glacial maximum. In this refuge, a local variant of the early Epigravedian developed. A modest number of archaeological sites, dated between 26,000 and 19,000 years ago, have been found scattered across the Italian peninsula and on the narrow western coast of the Balkan Peninsula, between the Adriatic Sea and the Dinaric Alps. From the base of the Italian Alps to Sicily and Greece, forager bands remained in contact with each other during the peak of the Ice Age. Connections were facilitated by a wide valley between these two peninsulas, which formed when sea levels dropped. Land was exposed where the northern half of the Adriatic Sea now lies. The mobility of people in southern Europe is evident from many examples of stone transported over hundreds of kilometers, including from sources in central Italy, across the Adriatic Plain, to the foothills of the Dinaric Alps. Even though these southern peninsulas provided a place for hunter-gatherers to survive during the peak of the Ice Age, these lands did not offer the most bountiful foraging grounds. Although warm for the time, the Mediterranean was drier than it is today. Southern Italy and Greece, along with parts of Iberia, were the driest places in Europe, and some areas transformed into semi-deserts. For example, in the northern plains of Italy, 
moisture mostly came from the rivers flowing from the mountains. This glacial meltwater deposited large quantities of sand in the lowlands, which resulted in a unique combination of desert-like sandbanks covered in drought-tolerant plants intermixed with riverine and wetland ecosystems. The regional decline in plant growth probably contributed to the disappearance of several large animals from this region by 24,000 years ago, including mammoth, rhinoceros, cave bear, and hyena. As forager bands moved through these lands, they primarily hunted bison, horse, and goat. The western coast of the Balkans received more precipitation, but not far from the shoreline, steep mountain ranges rose up limiting the amount of accessible land. The glacial maximum environment kept the human population small in these two southern peninsulas. The number of early Epigravedian sites discovered by archaeologists in Italy and the Balkans is small compared to other periods of the Upper Paleolithic. Furthermore, the poverty of artifacts at these sites suggests that forager bands became less socially complex. Unlike the preceding Gravedian, no art, burials, or ornaments can be clearly attributed to the early Epigravedian of this region, even though the Italian peninsula had been a center for the production of Venus figurines and extravagant grave goods. The loss of symbolic practices points towards a major change in the hunter-gatherer approach to life. They focused more on the material necessities. Even though bands maintained connections with their neighbors, social organization became less structured. Art and decorations were no longer used to mediate interactions with others, and hierarchy was no longer evident in treatment of the dead. For around 7,000 years, people in this southern refuge survived, but lost part of the richness of life experienced by their ancestors. This southern variant of the early Epigravedian had a complex origin. In fact, it's here that we find the strongest evidence for a southward migration of humans during the last glacial maximum. People arrived in Mediterranean Europe from areas north of the Danube River, probably the Carpathian Basin, and brought with them shouldered points. As we learned last episode, this type of stone tool was invented around 29,000 years ago and became a defining projectile weapon of the late Gravedian in the Russian steppe and around the Carpathian Mountains. But at the peak of the last ice age, around 24,000 years ago, shouldered points appeared widely across the Balkan and Italian peninsulas. The spread of this technology is believed to be a sign that forager bands refugees from the harshness of the north migrated to warmer lands and settled new hunting grounds. In the process, they introduced a new type of hunting weapon to local people. As these groups came into contact, stone nappers of this region also kept the Gravedian custom of producing backed bladelets. They even produced micro gravettes, a specific style of pointed bladelet made since the early Gravedian. Therefore, some academics argue that the term Epigravedian is most accurately applied to Southern Europe, where a strong connection to ancient toolmaking customs was perpetuated. These people maintained a heavy reliance on stone blades, a practice that is lost at this time in other parts of Europe. This efficient technological system, centered on stone blades and bladelets, had been used since the beginning of the Oryg nation. Although they no longer dressed in elaborate headdresses made of shells or sculpted female figurines, technological traditions here held a firm connection to the past. Aside from Mediterranean Europe, other forms of the early Epigravedian emerged among the people who survived further north in Central and Eastern Europe. Here, hunter-gatherers successfully adapted to a colder climate than any other people in Europe. Due to the geology of this region, 
few caves were available in which to take refuge during the cold winters. As a result, they often had to camp in the open. During the last glacial maximum, these people sought out deep valleys protected from the chilling winds. They must have been expert tailors, sewing clothing and shelters designed to retain warmth. At many of their camps, they used animal bones as fuel in their fires, an indication that wood was scarce. However, at a handful of early Epigravedian sites, from Austria to Ukraine, pine and birch charcoal was found in their campfires, showing that foragers sought out the streams, hills, and valleys where trees survived during the peak of the Ice Age. Much like in the southern peninsulas, the diversity of animals available to these people declined. In fact, the hunters of this region adapted to climate change by becoming reindeer specialists. The bones of this animal came to dominate the waste left at their camps. Reindeer can survive in the tundra, and people at the northern edge of human settlement depended on them for sustenance more than ever before. One victim of the last glacial maximum was the mammoth, which disappeared completely from Central Europe and parts of Eastern Europe around 22,000 years ago. Although adapted to the cold, these lumbering creatures consumed large quantities of vegetation, and the steppe was no longer as productive as it had once been. Mammoths would recolonize Europe from the east once the climate warmed 3,000 years after their disappearance. The absence of these giants likely forced people in this region to change important aspects of their life. During the Gravedian, their ancestors had relied on the meat, bones, ivory, and fur of these animals. Mammoth bone houses mostly disappeared from Eastern Europe during the last glacial maximum. As the worst of the Ice Age hit, human groups retreated to dwindling habitable areas and grew even more isolated from each other. Under these circumstances, Central and Eastern Europe witnessed a cultural simplification. For example, much like in the South, no early Epigravedian burials have been discovered. People produced art and ornaments less often, but these practices did not completely disappear. Also, stone nappers seemingly lost some of their predecessors' technical knowledge. Many Gravedian weapons fell out of use and were replaced with less precisely crafted tools. For example, during the last glacial maximum in Central and Eastern Europe, people stopped tipping their projectiles with shouldered points. At the same time that this tradition was carried to the Italian and Balkan peninsulas, it was dying out in the north. One circumstance that may explain this change is the decline in access to high-quality stone. Compared to the Gravedian, long-distance acquisition of raw material declined. Early Epigravedians surrounding the Carpathian Mountains were more likely to use stone collected close to their camps. Less access to high-quality raw material may have forced them to adopt different methods of stoneworking. This hypothesis is supported by the fact that from the Alps to the Black Sea, people made smaller stone tools during the last glacial maximum than during the Gravedian. There were three main pockets of human survival in this region during the cold, and in each, people followed a unique cultural trajectory. One of these lay within the Carpathian Basin, another along the eastern foothills of the Carpathian Mountains, and a third on the northern coast of the Black Sea. The decline in stone tool sophistication is most noticeable along the Middle Danube River of the Carpathian Basin. Here, stone workers employed more haphazard napping sequences and produced less standardized tool types. Simple flake tools became more common, reducing the importance of long blades, a defining aspect of the Upper Paleolithic. Also, very few bone tools have been found from this period. Weapon points of all types became rare in Central Europe, and the Gravedian custom of producing backed bladelets persists 
but to a much more limited degree. Ornaments have only been found at one early Epigravedian camp in the Carpathian Basin. This archaeological site is Grubgraben in Austria and was occupied by a group of people around 23,000 years ago. They drilled holes in fox teeth and shells, engraved zigzag patterns on batons, and carved ivory discs. Even a whistle made from a reindeer bone was discovered at their camp. Lying at the base of a hill, protected from the winds, Grubgraben is most interesting because it reveals a behavior unknown up until this point in European prehistory. The construction of stone pavements. The pavement was made from flat stones, carefully arranged to fit together. Smaller stones were used to fill gaps between larger ones. At another site, about 60 kilometers away, and also occupied during the last glacial maximum, two more similar pavements were discovered. The presence of preserved post holes and the concentration of artifacts around pavements at these sites has led to the interpretation that they were floors for living spaces around which huts were constructed. The builders of these pavements used these sites as winter camps, where they hunted reindeer and horse and burnt the wood of juniper and birch. At Grubgraben, another, even more enigmatic stone structure was unearthed. Large, flat stones were stacked, at least six high, in parallel rows. Their purpose is unclear, but these closely spaced walls may have been used as food storage or as meat smokers. It's interesting to wonder what drove nomadic hunter-gatherers to build such permanent architecture. Moving now to the east, the strip of land just north of the Black Sea was the warmest part of the Eastern European plains and was a refuge for hunter-gatherers during the last glacial maximum. As sea levels fell, the Black Sea shrunk substantially and became a saltwater lake separated from the Mediterranean Sea. Large areas of this lake were drained and transformed into arid grasslands on which herds of bison roamed. Few people had lived near the Black Sea during the Gravedian, but around 26,000 years ago, a unique culture appeared. The hunters of this culture specialized in bison. Their ancient camps have been found in the parts of Ukraine and Russia that were not flooded after the Ice Age by the rising waters of the Black Sea. The source of this culture is mysterious. Intriguingly, stone tools and cores found at these sites are unlike those made by either Gravedian or Epigravedian groups. The people of this Black Sea culture produced tiny microliths, their defining artifact. These were usually triangles or crescents, only one centimeter long by half a centimeter wide. Their edges were carefully trimmed to create specific shapes. Like most microliths, these elements would have been combined to make complex tools, including hunting weapons. When these microliths were first discovered several decades ago, they were assigned to the Org Nation because they were napped from boat-shaped cores, much like Org Nation people had used around 40,000 years ago. But with accurate radiocarbon dating of the bison bones these people hunted, we now know that they lived during the last glacial maximum. Therefore, the name Epiorg Nation is now used to designate this culture. The boat core technique of napping used by the Epiorg Nations is an example of a stone tool technology that was reinvented thousands of years after its initial appearance. Epiorg Nation culture seems to have been successful because it spread out from its heartland by the Black Sea. Microliths and boat-shaped cores began appearing further north and west, as far as the Middle Danube River. This might be evidence of a rare case of long-distance migration more than 500 kilometers during the last glacial maximum. Another hint of a connection between Central and Eastern Europe is the presence of a stone pavement like that of Grubgraben, at an Epi-Orignation campsite in southern Russia. 
the lack of similarity of epiorganation tools with those of the preceding Gravedian makes it difficult to know where these people originally came from. They lived on the periphery of Europe for 3,000 years. Then, around 23,000 years ago, epiorganation tools disappeared from the Black Sea region and were replaced by much more traditional epigravedian-backed platelets. As the Ice Age intensified, much of the Russian plain was abandoned by hunter-gatherers. The exception is the third pocket of human survival in Eastern Europe, the eastern foothills of the Carpathian Mountains and the adjacent hilly terrain around the Prut and Dniester rivers. Here, a stable population of foragers survived and developed a quite resilient form of Epigravedian culture. As descendants of the late Gravedians, they maintained a strong technological link to their ancestors, with backed bladelets and gravet points being central to their stone toolkit. Like the people of the preceding Kostenki of Devo culture, they made large bone tools, including picks, hammers, and shovels. Like other last glacial maximum survivors in Central and Eastern Europe, the people of this Eastern Carpathian culture struggled to obtain high-quality stone from foreign lands. They also abandoned the use of shouldered points and made smaller blades than their predecessors. Life inside mammoth bone huts ended, and people grew more and more dependent on reindeer hunting. In wooded mountain valleys and on hills covered by a mix of tundra and steppe plants, they slept inside lightweight circular tents with a central fire. In some cases, outlines of these tents can still be discerned amidst archaeological debris. These hunter-gatherers often camped next to rivers by reindeer crossings where they could easily ambush and kill their prey in large numbers. They also hunted fox and wolf for the valuable fur and used bone needles to sew clothing. This way of life allowed this Eastern Carpathian tribe to maintain a strong artistic tradition and to fashion intricate bone tools and ivory points. These characteristics are unknown in any other variants of the early Epigravedian. Unlike their Gravedian ancestors, they didn't sculpt figurines of animals or human women, but they did produce a wide variety of ornaments from animal teeth, shells, bone, stone, ivory, and antler. Among these, archaeologists have found finely carved ivory bracelets and beautifully engraved stone pendants. They pierced and engraved long batons of antler and carved fine tubular bone beads. In terms of symbolic expression, these reindeer hunters in the Eastern Carpathians were the most prolific of early Epigravedian tribes. Around 22,000 years ago, the environmental conditions of Eastern Europe declined to perhaps the most severe of the last glacial maximum. Dust storms deposited a thick layer of loess on top of some early Epigravedian camps near the Dniester River. During this climatic downturn, the human range contracted further. People disappeared from Moravia, taking refuge further south in the Carpathian Basin, where the climate was milder. Reprieve from this climatic assault would not come for many years. The ice would only begin its retreat around 19,000 years ago. Along the Mediterranean Sea, Danube River, Eastern Carpathians, and Black Sea, small groups of hunter-gatherers would survive this cold. But in the process, their art, technology, and social networks had become simplified, and Europe had been transformed into a cultural mosaic. The last glacial maximum had broken apart the Gravedian world of abundance. In our next episode, we will shift our attention to the West and examine the development of the Solutrean culture, a strikingly unique version of the Upper Paleolithic. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider becoming a patron of the show. Your support will allow me to continue bringing you our prehistory. <laughs>